So welcome to our new week. And I didn't want to quite make a new topic for this. I guess I can make this say week six and seven, but there's not much factoring that is new this week. What I have done is applications. So if we go to our polynomial thing and the whiteboards, then you have now a second whiteboard. Everyone see that link? And if you click on that, then you get to one that looks like this. So uh, a number of times, especially Victoria has commented, why are there like x squared plus five x minus three floating around on the paper? What possibly could this be in real life? What um, and I thought that's a great point. If you haven't had the kind of science classes or whatever to show you what these polynomials are for, then they just look very artificial. Some weird code game your math teacher is making you do. <laughs> so I wanted to have an, an answer to that. So here's nine different things that talk about different applications of multiplying polynomials. And I thought it would be useful and probably good GED prep time to just talk about these so you have more of a, a sense in your brain about why we're doing this and how they are fitting into real life. Because the GED is going to give you word problems, story problems. And so this kind of thinking will be nice. It, um, and I looked in the textbooks and they didn't have great application problems for this section. So I just had to invent them myself. So ta-da, that's what you get. Um, but we hadn't quite finished with just factoring and things like that. Um, that's the same as that, but not the copy. Okay, so if we want, we could go back to maybe a, as a warm-up, or maybe as more than a warm-up, do some factoring like we were last week. Um, did people get sick of factoring over the weekend with homework? Do you want me to do some now to get your brains back into that mode? Where do you want to start? Let's practice more. Yeah, practice practice more. Okay. Do you want to try this one yourselves or do you want me to do it? Let's give it a shot. Okay. Let me do a little bit of warm up then with a different one. <laughs> um, let me grab that one and pretend we haven't already done it. So I usually use the lane guest Wi-Fi and it's, it's not working. It's not working. Yeah. It's been iffy today. LCC this morning when I was subbing, I don't know the password for the LCC. Uh, right? There's a password. It's, yeah. So it's just your L number and then your oh, yeah, that's right. normal password. That's oh, right. I was like, I don't remember naming master bed. Yeah, I just use my L number and your password. Yeah. It's gonna literally make you like I have a login. Kind of like how like spinning my field do sometimes. I just tell my computer to remember my L. But okay, so I'll do this one. And then you're you can do this one. Sound good? Sorry. Is that a big enough font? Do you want me to make it bigger for people who are watching in Zoom? That's fine. That's fine. Okay, holler if you need it different. So the process was that a if this was ax squared plus bx plus c, that's our general format for these x squared trinomials trinomial three things like a tricycle, um, then we want the A and the C to multiply to something and the B also relates to that. Does that sort of ring a bell? And the way that I remember it is with a rectangle. Come on, G. So the area of my rectangle is the a times c. So in this case, a is 20. 
and C is negative 5. So 20 times negative 5 is negative 100. So I need two numbers that multiply together to get negative 100 as the area. What are these edges? They are probably not 20 and negative 5. Whatever they are, if I add them up, then I need to get to that middle number of our trinomial. So we need B is the length plus the width. And in this case, B is negative 48. Where did I see that? That B is negative 48, so that's what the things have to add up to, whereas the 20 and the negative 5 were the A and the C. Everyone okay with my quick review? All or if you want me to use different words for this. <clears throat> so what L and W will multiply together to get negative 100, but then add to get negative 48? And I just have to kind of fudge this a little. There's no secret way other than typing into Google of how do you know what these numbers are. So what things multiply to negative 100? A 1 and a negative 100, but that's not going to add up to negative 48. A two and a negative 50, ah, there we go. Those sum to 40, negative 48. So one of these numbers is two and the other is negative 50. It doesn't really matter which one you pick for which. This is ringing a bell. Want me to repeat things or say it in different words. So now I go back to the beginning. And I say, instead of 20x minus 48x minus 5, I break up that middle. Whoops, that should be a squared. Just didn't copy when I dragged it down. Instead of 20x squared minus 48x minus 5, I'll break apart this 48x into the positive 2 part and the negative 50 part. So I had a negative 48, and I replaced it with these two numbers that add up to negative 48. Why did I do that? Because I trust that the process works. And there's some theory where someone figured this out, but our job isn't to reinvent the wheel. It's just to say, yes, this works. Here we go. If you want to figure out why it works, then foil this when we're done, and you'll see how it kind of fits together. But that's not something I have the communication skill to really do. So now I will look at the first two terms, 20x squared plus 2x as one thing, and the next two terms, negative 50x minus 5 as another. What comes out of the first two terms? A 2x comes out of both. 2 goes into 20, and x goes into x squared. 2 goes into 2, x goes into x. What did we have left? 10x plus 1. And in this case, it looks like minus 5 is the best for what comes out. And again, I have 10x plus 1. And the part that's inside these parentheses is always going to match. That's the magic of this routine. And then I notice, ah, oh, but this part and this part, I can undistribute. and say that this is a 2x minus 5 times the 10x plus 1. I am backwards foiling. If I foiled things, I'd have first, which is here. I'd have inside, which is here. I'd have outside, which is here. And I'd have last which is here. 
So my process is just a foil process backwards. And when I told you a week ago, do lots of foil homework because what comes next will make more sense. And this is what I'm talking about. If you've done a lot of homework, you're nodding your head and says, yes, this flows nicely in my brain. And if you've been too busy to do homework, then you're like, our brain hurts right now. But either way, we got the answer. So uh, I can put a box around it be done. So I have factored what started out as a x squared polynomial and turned it into two no bigger than x polynomials multiplied together. Again, the fancy word is that this is a trinomial, tri for three parts, and these are binomial, like bicycles, with two parts. So all of that is right there for you to stare at. And I should be good and put the link in chat so you don't have to go into Moodle and find it. And now it's your turn as a group to do the x squared plus 13x plus 42. So you could scroll around and mimic me. If mimicking is your style of doing things, you can talk to each other out loud, um, try and figure out which things work for this one. If you're the kind of person that wants to do it on paper and then see if other people do it the same way, that can work too. Brenda and Victoria and Kayla are very quiet. Do you have ideas? Hi, Pazum Suk. You joined, I think, after I put some the link to the gym board to the whiteboard in the chat. So I'm going to put it in the chat again in case you couldn't see it the first time. Yay, okay. <laughs> As a tangential topic about times, I'm still not quite sure why they schedule these things starting at 6 instead of 6.30. It seems like we could all get a bit more dinner if it started later, but I am not the boss. 
I think they lock slotting it on the hour. Uh, starting at on the hour. But yeah, but yeah, make you leave about 10 minutes at before the hour. My, sense. My, my classes on campus also end like 10 minutes before the hour. That's so random. It is. I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense. Maybe it's supposed to be like, if you have one on the hour where you have 10 minutes to get your next class. Mm -hmm. What happens? Like, I have psychology from 10 to 11.50 and then I have from 12 to 1. That makes sense. Oh, and by the way, no one has told me really when they want office hours, so I might just pick something different than Monday at noon if you don't have suggestions, but you know, that's not helping anyone to have them there, so it can't get more useless. Okay, our taco eater is typing the most. Don't let Kayla embarrass you. Talk to each other or maybe write something or type something. You know, let me just change my screen for a moment so you can see the example problem better. I don't want to. Give you too little room to write clearly. Did anyone find which two numbers to use? Which numbers add up to 13? Six and seven. Six and seven. They also make two. Yeah. yeah, six, seven. I'm going to move this down a little bit. So we had a little rectangle. And you noticed that if it was six, whoops smaller. Okay, if it was 6 and 7, it was multiplied to 42. They add up to 13, that's what we want, and they multiply to 42, which is 1 times 42, because there's a 1 hiding there. Everyone okay with that? Yeah. So then we finish what Kayla had started been taping while dribbling a taco and a toddler. 6x plus 7x plus 42. Okay, what comes out of x squared plus 6x? Sorry, so with x squared plus 6x, what can you pull out to the front? Uh, 6x squared. Uh, there's not that much. Let me write it all by itself. It makes all six. Yeah, all I have that's common to both is the x. Um, right? That's an x times x to six times x. So x, x plus six. But I'm going to make it lined up nice. But it's kind of a, a mental trick to visually separate just this part from the rest and focus on that. And what you're pulling out is always going to be smaller. You're taking an x out of the first two all the time. So there won't be any x squares left because you're stealing that away. 
Okay, and then what comes out of the second pair? Seven. Seven. And lo and behold, it matches. And then we keep the x plus six the same. Yeah. What, what the other thing? Seven. Seven. And so this goes there and that goes there. I have a question. Sure. Will it ever matter? Because I, I kind of got the same answer just with the mm -hmm. flipped around. Because I put the seven instead of the six. That's ahead. fine. That will never matter. That will never matter. Right. All you're doing is rewriting the order yeah, of the two things. So. Okay, great. <clears throat> so I'm attributing your silence earlier to just eating and being uh, not in the math low as class starts so early, because I don't think you had trouble with that. But if that was harder than it looks, let me know. OK, I'm moving on to this Jamboard. And up at the top, I still put the, uh, the goals for our topic, because it's good to keep those in mind. We're going to practice multiplying and factoring again. But now we're going to make everyone happy, especially Victoria, and talk about why we care about polynomials. What are some examples of what might happen? So in this problem, we have 100 feet of deer netting. And we want to make a rectangular area so the deer don't eat our garden. And rectangular gardens feel nice. How long should you make each side? If we say that one side is x, and I'm not quite sure how big x is, then how big is the other side? That's really huge and puffy now. Smaller. So there's x. I know the whole perimeter, all four sides, will be 100 when I add them up. So what are two sides going to add up to? If it was a perfect square, it'd be 25 a side. Yeah, but we don't know it's a square. But we do know I've gone halfway around now with my red arrow. So, so if all the way around was 100. Oh, all the way around. That one was 600. No, all the way around. Oh, so, Okay. Move 100 to another 600. That... Halfway around is 50. Everyone okay with that? Because that's 50, and that one's also 50. So if one side is x, then the other side is 50 minus x. So they'll add up to 50. Everyone okay with that? Yes. I can keep those there. That's fine. X. So the area, area formula is length times width. It's x times 50 minus x. So it is that x times 50 is 50x x times negative x is a negative x squared, 50x minus x squared. And we wanted that product to be the 600, right? That's the area. So 600 equals 50x minus x squared. Now these always look nicest if the x squared is positive. That's a good habit to train your brain. So I'm going to move the x squared term to the other side of the equal sign so that it becomes positive. 
Everyone happy with that strategy? Mm -hmm. If I do a plus x squared to both sides, now we have x squared plus 600 equals 50x. Whenever we move something from one side to the other, it changes from negative to positive or positive to negative, because that's how addition and subtraction work. OK, now I want to keep going. I want to move the 50x to the other side. So that's going to become a negative. So I have my polynomial equals 0. And this equals 0 makes me very happy because of something called the zero product property. The zero product property simply says when things multiply to be zero, one of them has to be zero. There's nothing else that multiplies to get zero. So we're going to use that. First, we're going to factor our polynomial. Can anyone see what two negative numbers add up to negative 50 and multiply to 600? One A and thirty. One A and thirty. Yeah. So in this case, I'm going to come over to the side to do this. We're going to have the A times C equals 600. The B is negative 50. Um, the numbers that work. Are negative 20 and negative 30. I could make my list 1 times 600, 2 times 300, until I finally got two things that add up to negative 50. But sometimes you can just stare at it, especially if you have practice. This is another time where the more homework you do, the faster this comes to your brain if you have, as I'm working out your mental muscles. OK, so let's break apart that negative 50 into a negative 20 of x's and a negative 30 of x's. From the front, I always get an x. From the back, uh, whoops, I want to make it minus so that the thing inside is positive, minus 30 x minus 20, and then when I unfoil, x minus 30 times x minus 20. Everyone okay with my factoring? So I'm going to rewrite that, whoops, on my main paper. Hopefully without, or there, okay. So if these two things, when I multiply them, are 0, then at least one of them has to be 0. This one is 0 when? Let me point to the whole thing. Yeah. When x is 30. When x is 30. And this one is 0. when x is 20.
So everything is true when x is 30 or x is 20. We suddenly move from just manipulating numbers to saying, hey, this thing is true at certain cases. If I go back to where I was, then, ah, so that means one of them is 20. Whoops, I'm gonna draw on it. Which one was right? It was the 20 and the 30 are the two sides I want. That will make the rectangular area of 600. That was my goal. In this case, maybe guess and check would have been faster. Does 10 and 90 work? No. Does 20 and 30 work? Hey, it does. Or 10 and 40, I'm sorry, it has to add up to 50. But the procedure was methodical and did get us the answer. So to, to kind of take a step back, what happened? There was a situation, an area formula, where I am multiplying two things together. There was a length and a width, and I knew what happened when I multiplied them. But they weren't plain numbers that I was multiplying. They were something with an X in it, because I could make one bigger and the other shrink. And I knew that when I multiplied them together, something was true, so I had to find what they were. Okay, questions about that? I'm not sure how many things like this you've seen in your life, if this is your first word problem of polynomials, or if this is like, oh yeah, I've seen this years ago. It's definitely interesting, but it's kind of not too bad. Definitely the first time I'm experiencing it. Okay, well, I racked my brains, as I love you all so much. We have nine of them. Which one do you want to do next? Piggy bank. I'll go say what's the piggy bank. The piggy bank. Okay. It looks like I need more room. So I'm going to actually grab. Okay. Okay. See if I can do this well. These over. Grab down. Those over. Did I leave anything behind? Yes. My boxes. Okay, piggy bank, here we come. Everyone can read that, big enough font. A family will invest their retirement savings in a boring mutual fund that slowly increases in value. If we let Y be how many years happened since today, since 2024, then the value in dollars of one share is 2Y plus 50. So they're buying something now for 50 bucks. Next year, it'll be worth 52. In two years, it'll be worth 54. In three years, it'll be worth 56. Everyone okay with the first paragraph? Yeah. And each year, they're gonna keep buying more of this thing. So how many shares they own is 14Y plus six. So right now, each thing they buy is 50 bucks and they have six of them. Then next year, they'll be worth 52 bucks and they're going to buy 14 more than before, right? They'll have 20 of them total. In year three, it's up to 54 bucks. I'm sorry, year, year two, two years from now, I'm thinking of zero when I should. Two years from now, it will be 54 bucks and they'll have 28 plus six is 34 of them. So, so as the um, years go on, they just set aside um, a little bit of money and it's gonna be a little more each year. But most people, when you get old, your income goes up and right? your job and career gets better, which is a good thing tangentially to keep in mind since it's an election year. Politicians like talking about the rich versus poor, but that's usually really the young versus the old in disguise. There's a few super wealthy people that affect politics too much, uh, but a lot of the politicians are just trying to get you angry at your grandparents, basically. Uh, so, theater. anyway, 
Okay, so what's the formula for how much they have in their retirement savings? So total saved. What do we do with our information? Can we add up about past together, teacher? Yeah, how am I going to put the two things together? Um, I cannot explain. I can show the language. Yeah, so let me see if I can. See? see <laughs> and then I can see you bigger. You want to add the two things? Yeah. Okay, let me put that back on the board, and then I will... I didn't make some control stuff. Oh, there we go. Okay, if we add them, we're putting together things that have different units. Because this part is dollars, and this part is a number of things they own. And I can't add apples and oranges. If they're not the same kind of thing, I can't add them. It's like common denominators. So adding isn't the right idea. What might be a better thing to put in the middle? I'm Times, yeah. Does it make sense for times? If I have how much money one thing costs and then how many of them I have, does that yes. give us the total amount of money? Sure. Yeah, think of it with shopping for other things. If, I, if apples are 50 cents each and I buy four of them, that's $2 and multiplying. Okay, good, good. So if I multiply it together, what do I get? 2y, I'm doing FOIL, right? First, 2y times 14y, 2 times 14, 28, 28 y squared. Inside, 50 times 14. If I have 14 half dollars, how much money do I have? Seven yeah, $7. That was inside. Now I do outside. 2y times 6. 2 times 6 is 12. And 6 times 50 is 300. Pardon me. Let me move the pig. I'm just going to move that too. Okay, never mind. Big days. Everyone okay with my oil? Yeah. Then the step is the y terms without the squared. I can combine those. If I have 700 of something and 12 more, that's just 712 these y's. Oh, okay, I'm going to look at my calculator and do a few examples of this. So I will go up to welcome and syllabus, and I will get out my resources and online calculator. Okay, so let's try a few different values of this. So 
give me a number. How many years in the future should we look? 10. 10. Okay, 10 years. Well, 10 is easy. I don't need the calculator for that. So 10 times 10 is 100. So 28 times 100 will be a 28 with two zeros. 712 times 10 will be with one zero. And then 300. Okay, maybe I do want a calculator because mm -hmm. my brain is tight. So 2,800 plus 7120 plus 300, oops, it is 10, 2, 2, 0. And I'll put a label on it because it's a word problem. Okay, well, 10,000 bucks is nice. It's not going to last very long in retirement, though. No, it's only a thousand years. What about if we go 50 years? Same as 50 years. Can we do like 53 or something? 53, sure. Yeah, <laughs> Oops, I want that one. I have a harder time with odd numbers than I do even. Okay. Is it YRS okay for years? Okay, so 28 times 53 squared times 53 squared plus out of the way, okay. Plus 712 times a plain 53. Plus or 300. So 116,688. Even though that's not that much for retirement. <laughs> 100, what did I say it was? 116,688. Yeah, that sounds like a lot, but for especially a family yeah, that's retiring, not. that's not really enough. If you want to learn more about retirement, then when I teach math 25, uh, whoops, no. Then I have a retirement chapter. I'm just going to put it in the Zoom link. And if you're curious, you can look at it on your own. Is that actually a link? It is. <laughs> They've changed your Zoom chat to hide links. Okay, anyway. So, yeah, it's not terribly unrealistic, but they need to buy more than their formula says. I mean, just a few shares of 50-ish isn't going to get you a happy retirement. Again, one problem with this is it was linear. The amount of shares they bought each year increased steadily over time. Yeah, and that's not how real life works, right? When you're a college student or in your 20s, you don't have a lot of money. And when you're in your 50s and 60s, you know, hopefully your career has advanced and you have a lot more. So you're doing a whole lot of savings in your late 40s and 50s and early 60s compared to earlier. So it should be a like a parabola, something that goes up steeply, not a straight line. Yeah, so also, part of it is our assumption was wrong. It's also like accountants for better pay, inflation, and all that too. So. Okay, so let me zoom out so you can see the pig problem all happy. So another example of multiplying polynomials in real life. If you have a dollar amount for each thing, that's a formula. How many of them you have was another formula. So the total value was the product. We didn't try factoring this, but maybe the GED would give you 28y squared plus 712y plus 300 and ask you to factor that. And then when you did, and you got the 2y plus 50 times 14y plus 6, it could say 
if the value of each share was 2y plus 50, what might the 14y plus 6 represent? Something like that. Okay, questions about this one? Okay, zoom out. We have bird population, cryptography, speed, time, and distance with a drone, probability, epidemiology. Oh, can we do probability? Probability, okay. My 12 year old is just learning about trick taking card games. So I taught him, oh, well, if you know that one. Um, and he doesn't know enough good card games. So I also am going to later teach him Egyptian rat screw, but we haven't done that yet. What is that? What is that? You don't know that? Okay. So take a deck of cards. We'll deal that out to the four of us. We're all sitting close together, sitting on the floor. It's like spoons. You want to sit on the floor kind of close together. On your turn, don't look at your cards. It's not that kind of game. On your turn, you just take the top card from the pile in front of you and turn it face up in the middle. And it's like, you know, and we're taking turns doing this, but going fast, like you're playing spoons. And if you don't know spoons, I'm sorry, but I can't back up that much. So there's a whole list of rules for when you're allowed to slap the pile. Like if two cons two numbers that are the same come out, I play a seven and then you play a seven. Uh, or okay. if there's that but with a sandwich, one in the middle. Yeah. If I play a seven, she plays a five, you play a seven. Or a marriage, if a king and a queen are adjacent and so on. There's too many rules I... to keep track of. And then you, if you slap it, and it turns out that you're either misseeing cards or misremembering the rules, then there's a penalty. If it's valid, then you get to take all those cards and you want to be the last one with cards. So it's a, a frantic, silly game that is good when you're college age and tends to not get played as much in your 50s. But anyway. I have played that just under the name Slaps. Ah, okay. <laughs> was, what's the name of that? What'd you call? What did you call the game? What did I call it? Um, Egyptian rats room up there. Egyptian rats. That's what the uh, like officially on the internet is called. Mm -hmm. So even the bicycle card game website has it. The surprise. Anyway, okay, back to math. <laughs> A group of college students plays two different card games. Gordon is the best at this, and he often wins unless he drinks a lot. So if B is the number of beers he drinks then his chance of winning, oh well, is 0.8 minus 0.1b. So let's change that into percentages. What is 0.8 as a percentage? 80. 80%. Everyone remember their percent math? Yeah. Do you know rip lock? Did anyone ever tell you rip lock? No idea. That no, somebody should have told you rip lock. Okay, time out, tangent. So rip lock. stands for right into percent and then left out of percent. I should probably have done it okay, the other way, but anyway. So if you have 0.8, then you're going, it's always two decimal place scoops because percents are about 100. 100s always have two zeros. So we're stuck with two decimal point scoops. But if I have 0.8, then I am going out of percent, I'm sorry, into percent. So I will go to the right two decimal points. So right, and I get 80%. Whereas if I start with eight, 80% and I want to get rid of that percent symbol. Now I am going out of percent. So I go to the left. Right. There's a hidden decimal point right there because it could have been 80.3 or something. So then I get my 0.8. So it's a memory trick, rip flop for do you go right or left? Are you going into percent or out of percent? Interesting. 
Okay, anyway, we're going out of percent, so we went to the left. I'm sorry, into percent, so we went to the right. I can see what I'm doing. Okay. And point one B, that's 10% per beer. Right? If he drinks one beer, he's 10% worse. If he drinks two beers, he's 20% worse, and so on. Are we okay with this? This formula obviously has a restriction. If he drinks four beers, he's at zero. So B can't be any number at all. It's only one, zero to four. So he's a lightweight. Okay, and then for the other card game, it's 0. 0.6 minus 0. 0.2 B. So he's worse than that. Um, actually, I'm gonna edit it, that's my problem. I'm gonna just change it and say, let's make this 0.15 B, partly to scare Victoria and partly so that he gets to zero with four beers for both of them. Okay, so if we want an equation to talk about what's the chance that he plays one game of Oh Well and one game of Egyptian Rat Screw and he wins both. So how do we put probabilities together? Think about snake eyes with dice. If you want to roll a one, that's one out of six. And if you want to roll another one, that's another one out of six. Whoops, and Miro quit. Try. Come on. Be good, Miro. Oh, did Zoom just die also? Mm -hmm. Zoom just died. So come back. I can wave to you in the D10, but my computer is having issues, so I'm sorry. Should we try LCC Wi-Fi? It's been working for me. It is working for you. I think um, the guys were saying that Something happened on the houses we get on the link guest. Um, what happened? Okay. Do, do, do. I really wish the cable on the podium would work. It's supposed yeah. to just be you plug it in and then you're hardwired, which is better than anything. Okay, try now. Um, there's there. Go back to general zoom mode. Okay, I'll close you. Yep, yep, I got it. Okay, share screen. Let's so back up and see my, yes, thank you. Okay. And I bet I have to hit record again. No, oh, it remembers. Okay. Sorry about the computer glitch, we're back. So there was one out of six for rolling one dice, and there was one out of six for getting a one on the other die. So what's the chance of getting snake eyes with a sum of two? Two out of 12. Well, are there 12 things? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No, nope, there's a lot more than 12 ways two dice can happen. How many numbers are in my box overall? 36. 
36. And so, only one of them is snake eyes. So how am I taking two individual things and putting them together to find the probability of them both happening one after the other? Two, 36, two, I don't know. You were cutting out, I'm sorry, Victoria. Tell me again, what do I do with the six? Uh, squared. It's a squared in this case, but in general, I multiply them. Like the <laughs> Find the chance for the next event is the chance they happen in succession. Oh, that makes sense. Six, I think it's a six, six, three, six. So if this chance for one event is here and the chance for the other event is there, then we need to multiply them. So 0.8 minus. Point 0.8 minus 0.1b. You don't have to put zeros in front of dec decimal points, by the way. I'm doing that because I'm lecturing. 0. 0.6 minus 0. 0.15b. OK, let's do our FOIL. The first, 0. 0.8 times 0. 0.6. 6 times 8 is 48. Two decimal point scoots, so we have 0. 0.48. Everyone OK with that? Inside, 0. 0.1 and 0. 0.6. The point one is going to move the decimal point by one in a smaller way. So we get minus 0.06 of Bs. Check that on a calculator if you don't trust me. Why is that? Why does point one do that? Yeah. Um, because other tangent. If I have 10 times three, then that's putting one zero on. If I have 100 times three, that's putting two zeros on. It makes sense in the big number direction, right? The more than, although that's a terrible little zero there. Okay. So if I have, and of course, one times three is three. So you can kind of see a pattern that each time I go down, it's divided by 10. But there's more than that. If I have 0.1 times three, I know from the pattern it's going to be 0.3. But I could also say that this is one tenth times three this point one and one tenth are the same that's even like the formal way to say point one is yeah. one tenth right if i was a stenographer in a law courtroom then i wouldn't say point one i would say one tenth of something right that's like the fancy dress and tie way to say point one so what's one tenth times three we're going to make that a three over one and have three tenths and look, this one is three tenths. That makes sense. And then when you're already doing one of the decimal, it's going to bring down again. Right. So if I have 0. 0.01 times three, that's going to be 0. 0.03 because of the pattern. Okay. But it also makes sense with the fraction. If we have one hundredth times three over one, that's going to be three hundredths. And that's three tenths, hundredths, as I say it formally. So whatever whole number I have is just going to jump on the numerator. Okay. And whatever denominator, the decimal 0 0.01, 0 0.001, whatever, that's just going to tell you the denominator. And that's how fractions go. Anyone need more words than that? Yes. Yes, please. Uh, yes. yes. Um, okay, so let me do one more row and use different words. So what if I have 0 0.001 multiplied by 3? That's going to take the 3, and this one, compared to a normal one, had three decimal point scoots left. So it's going to do the same thing to my 3.
that's the pattern is whatever I, however many zeros I have, two zeros makes the decimal point for the three go over that many times. And it's not quite counting zeros because I have to start from where like, this is really 1.0, right? There's, there was a hidden decimal place of where I started with before I turned this into a decimal. Anyway, did any of that make more sense to you, Pazum Sook? Oh, this it okay for me this year. I I I thought it's worth a rolling the square the square one. The square one? Yeah. I mean the square one that when people over here? Yeah, yeah. Oh, this we'll information I I still use my brain working on this. Okay, well I don't want to distract you then. Okay, so what do we've done? We've done our first. We've done the inside. So we must be on the, I'm doing them in the wrong order for foil. Anyway, okay, I'm still on foil wrong. Let's do the outside. So a negative, it's gonna be negative, 0. 0.8 times 0. 0.15. Let's cheat and use our calculator. 0.8 times 0.15 is 0.12. And then the last, oops. No. Eraser tool. Get rid of that a little bit. We're about to erase before. Okay, and now I want to do the last. 0.1 times 0.15, that's again going to take this decimal place and make it smaller by one, because that's what times 0.1 does. 0 0.024. 0 0.024. 0 0.024. 0 0.024. Uh, just 0 0.15. Where did you get a 0.024? Oops, that's 0.16 times 0.15. Where did you get the 6? That's oh, a B. It's a B. It's a B. <laughs> <That's> a B. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, okay. Just kidding. Blue test and you. Okay. Um, B. So B times B is B squared. I'm sorry, my B's look like sixes. Okay. Everyone okay with my foiling then? Again, the middle terms are plain B's, so I can combine them. And I also want to kind of follow tradition and put this B squared term first. So I have 0 0.15 b squared minus 0 0.18 will be the total b's plus 0 0.48. So you could plug in b is 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, and see the chance of Gordon winning both games one after the other. Notice if I plug in zero, this term is going to go away times zero, and this is going to go away times zero. So he has a 48% chance. That's the best he's going to do. You're pretty good odds. Okay, comments on this one? Oh, no. Again, we're simplifying real life, just like most people don't save a linear amount more each year, then most people don't get linearly worse at card games as they drink. But we're kind of making easy equations because that's what we're learning. This, the, the purpose is like, oh, yes, here's two things that are changing. They have a variable in it. And there's some real life time that we would multiply them together. In one case, it's because Paul because probabilities multiply when you're doing one after the other. In the other case, it was because it was the cost per thing and how many. In another one, it was length times width. So there we go. Okay, what's next?
Cryptography. Okay. Codes. Two points determine a line. Show that you remember this by finding the equation of the line that goes through. I need to get bigger to do this. My artwork is not that good. Negative five, three. So one, two, three, four, negative five, up three. That's too big. Can I make my any thinner? No, that's maximum thinness. Oh, okay. Everyone okay with going back five and up three? Yeah. Yeah. And now I want forward five, one, two, three, four, five, and down three. So there is positive five, there is negative three. And so there's a line that connects them both. Can I do this artwork? Good enough, that's as good as my artwork will be. Okay, everyone okay with what line we're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm purposefully a little sloppy. Does that actually go through the origin point there in the middle? I'm not sure. Okay. Let's have you figure it out. How would how did you find the line that goes through two points? Who remembers that process? Isn't that um, y1? negative y2 over x2 negative x1. That's a great start. y1 minus y2 over x1 minus x2. In this case, let's have it be 3 minus a negative 3 over negative 5 minus a positive 5. So we get positive six, negative five minus five more is negative 10. And we can simplify that to being divide by two top and bottom, negative three fifths. So what is that negative three fifths? It's that not the whole equation. Your rise of a run, which slope. That's the slope. Okay, is that ringing bells for people? It's been a few weeks, good memory. Okay, so my equation is going to be y equals minus 3 fifths x plus, and then some number there. Where does it cross the up and down y axis? So to find that, Six, you plug in zero. zero for x, right? Zero, yeah. If I plug in zero for this line, what's going to happen? Well, I'm not sure because I don't know what that number is. Let's look at our graph. I know what my rise and run is. If I go down three and over five, I really am at the zero, zero point, right? because I know my slope. I know I can go down three and over five. So yeah, that gets me to zero, zero. So this is- so That's it. That's it. There's nothing here, right? I could put a plus zero, but I don't need to do that. It's just y is negative three fifths x. Okay. Yeah. So the point of that review not only was to do some good review, but to remind us that if you give me two points, there's only one line that goes through those two points. And I can find the formula for it if I remember to have. So it impressed me that similarly, if there are three points, then there's only one, whoops, that shouldn't say polynomial, uh, x squared. Oh, 
polynomial. So instead of a plain X polynomial for lines, then an X squared polynomial you need for three points. And there'd be only one that goes through those three points. So there's a trick in cryptography, code breaking, called Chenier's secret sharing. And here's a simplified version of how it works with small numbers. Of course, in real life, we'd use computers and giant ugly numbers. So say that there's a company, and if you really need to know, they will give you the password 1012. But so far, no one knows this password except the company security officer. The company has five like CEO type officers. Um, here we go, vice presidents. And any three of them should be able to get together and find what the password is. So if the security officer dies in a car accident, they can get together and find the secret password they need. Reboot their computer system or whatever it is. But we don't want them to be able to get it with only one or two of them. We need three of the five VPs to cooperate to get the new password. With me so far? So here's how you make it secret like that. You're going to pick an X squared kind of polynomial where the constant term is your secret number, 1012. Then you're going to find five different points on the polynomial. Okay, well, we can do that. We don't want to use zero as an X value because that would tell you what the secret thing is. But if I plug in one, what do I get? One plus 257 plus 1012. Two, two, seven, zero. And if I plug in two, then two squared becomes four. So four plus 257 times two, plus 10, 12, so 15, 30. Only the first one's final. Oh, no. Here. 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 Uh, did I do it wrong? 257. I do times by yeah, two. Yeah, you, you hit two, two. You hit two, 12, so 10, 12. Uh, yeah. Thank you. OK, 12, 70. That looks better. OK. Oh. OK. And so on. So I do that a few more times, and I get five coordinates. Then I give one of those to each vice president. And I'm not showing you how, but there is some math tricks you could use to any three of them could get their coordinate points together and find what the formula was. And if you don't even know the math, then there's just websites that will do this for you. You can plug in the three points and it tells you which X squared kind of polynomial goes through that. So it's okay if the VPs are bad at math, they could still do this. Oh, okay, so, so far so good. We have what you want. You've given out your five pieces of paper. They have a coordinate pair on it and any three people could cooperate and get the secret code number. But you might forget the code number and you don't wanna just leave this lying around in your desk drawer because someone might see it and know that 1012 was the secret number. So at least you're going to factor your number so that it looks a little more secret. How would we factor x squared? Plus 257 x plus 1012. That looks huge, but it's not that bad. Let's start looking at what numbers multiply together to get one times 1,012, so just 1,012. 
So 1 times 1,012, is that going to work? No, that doesn't add up to 257. Is it even? Sure, 506. Is that going to work? No. Does 3 go into this? Remember our secret rules? If we add up 1, 0, 1, and 2, we get 4. 3 doesn't go into 4, so Ooh, 3 is trick. going to go into that. 4. Is 4 going into this? The last two digits are 12. 4 goes into 12, so 4 is going to go into this. So it's going to be 4 times something. Um, it's going to be, what, 250? 4 times makes 1,000. So 253, did I do that right? Yeah. Oh, and look, those add up to 257. That's what I wanted. So this is a x plus 4 times an x plus 253. So I could write down 4 and 253 and hide them in different places in my office. And then if I forget the code, that's okay. I can rebuild my thing. Now, in real life, you'd use more complicated numbers. You would not pick a polynomial that has a one by the X, because that just means these two numbers multiply to get your secret code and so on. But for the simple example, and this is a example from cryptography, where you can multiply, or in this case, factor or something, and it would be useful to do so. Interesting. That's a little demo. Do you want to see the fancy website work? Sure. 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 Are you like bothered that we? Okay. So let's get a good <laughs> point. I did sort of like not do the fun thing. Let's do the fun thing. So 9 plus 257 times 3. Plus 10, 12. Oops, why did you go down there? 257 times 3 plus 10, 12. So 1792. Okay, so go to our fancy website. Yeah, we do the uh, one, twelve, seven. Yeah, what's happened? No, I don't want a video. Stop. Uh, oh well, I have an ad. Everyone know about the Brave browser, by the way. Brave browser. Yeah. yeah. So the reason I didn't know this site has an ad is because I use the Brave browser at home, which blocks ads automatically, including ads in YouTube. So if you're sick of watching ads on YouTube, install the Brave browser and watch your things there. Now, is that anything like a VPN hider and stuff like that? Um, it has a private window that does that. Yeah, it's, it's like its own web browser service area. Okay, anyway, where were we? One comma, let me make this bigger, 1270. Okay, then we had two, 1530. And three, 1792. And then calculate the equation. And if I scroll to the bottom, there we go. Ta-da, there's our equation in the yellow box. <laughs> so it works. Fancy, okay. Okay, back to the big view. What do you want to do next? David, do you have any equation for win a lottery? The equation for what? How win, to win a lottery. lottery. <laughs> no, I can't tell you how to be lucky with math. Uh, if you want to learn about the lottery and stuff, the best math book is called The Black Swan. Have you heard of this book? Yes. Oh, so it's a I bestseller just... about unlikely events and how much they affect the world. 
so much of modern life isn't because people are hardworking and smart. It's because incredibly rare things happen and change the world. So that's a good book if you want to read about winning the lottery and other unlikely things. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Normally, I heard only statistic, statistic that they calculate the the time of the period the lottery, but I didn't hear this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There is something called expected value that you can use when talking about the lottery that comes up on the GED. Do you know about expected value? No. So okay, let me do that then. Um, let's make this bigger. It's also called weighted average. Um, there we go. Is that big enough to read for everyone? Yes. So imagine that there's someone the same guy that writes the Black Swan writes another book called Fooled by Randomness. And he talks about how idiot investors can be, especially the ones he's worked with as his career in, as an investor. So he said, what if I told you that the chance the stock market going up next week is 70% and the chance it goes down is 30%. But I also tell you that I am buying what's called shorts, which means I am going to make money if the stock market goes down. Could that make sense? And when he asks that to lecturing to a room full of professional investors, they say, no, if you think it's a 70% chance it'll go up, you should bet it goes up, right? So he says, oh, but what if when it goes up, it's only gonna go up a dollar, but if it goes down, it's gonna go down $500,000. Then, even if it only has a 30% chance of going down, that's the bet I should take. Because if I'm wrong, I'm only going to miss a $1 increase. And if I'm right, then I'm not you know, blowing up and going bankrupt. So when you're thinking about how important that loss. Yeah, okay. So if you're thinking about probabilities, it's not just how likely something is to happen, but how big that event is that matters. And so mathematically, you want to multiply these things. And the thing that happens all the time is what's my overall grade? It's not only what percent of my grade, which is working like a probability in this right-hand column, but what's my score? And I have to put those together. So I have to multiply those things. So let me take this example and stick it on our whiteboard. Move up here out of the way. Make that look a little smaller. Okay. I don't know, by the way. So let's multiply these. One column I have to make into decimals. So I'm just going to pick this one. Since they're both percentages, it doesn't really matter. But this is the one that could be a probability. In this case, it's what percentage of your grade is. And this one, we normally write grades as percents, but they could just be points, right? The fact that these are written as percents don't really matter. Okay, so let's multiply across and then see what we get. So 90 times 0.1 is 0.9, using that scoot things over, I'm sorry, is nine, using that scoot things over one trick we just learned right? from 90 to plane nine. 80 times 0 0.2, 8 times 2 is 16. I'm going to add a 0 because of the 80, but take away a 0 because of the point with the 0 0.2. 82 times 0 0.2, that one I'm going to cheat. 16.4, okay.
84 times 0.2, that would be what, 16.8 now? Mm -hmm. And 79 times 0.3, Twenty-three point seven. Okay. So once I have all of those, then I add them all up. So nine plus sixteen. Maybe someone with a calculator is faster than me. Nine plus sixteen plus sixteen point four plus sixteen point eight plus twenty-three point seven. Did I forget one? I think that's all. So 81.9. So overall, my grade is 81.9. And whatever label you had in this column, percent, oranges, inches of rainfall, whatever, that's the label you get in your answer. So people do this all the time in real life without even thinking about it. So... If you're a farmer, you don't care, yes or no, is it going to rain tomorrow? You want to know the percent chance it rains a little, the percent chance it rains medium, the percent chance it rains a lot, and then you can know what to say to sprinklers. Right? If you're about to wait at the airport gate with a toddler, you don't care, is your plane late or not? You want to know what's the chance it's 10 minutes late or 30 minutes late or an hour late, because I'm going to need to, like, buy some snacks and stuff it's, it's an hour late and so on. So there's lots of examples in real life where you weight the different categories of outcomes by how big and significant they are as well as the chance they will have. So ta-da, weighted average, otherwise known as expected value for <clears throat> good useful thing. And I could have made an example of this because we're multiplying things. Oh, that's... Oh, I totally forgot about our seven o'clock break. Do we want a break? Like, no, like five minutes minutes left. Left. Yeah, but if someone needs to pee really badly, then. Okay, run away if you need to. Um, speed, time, distance. Speed, time, and distance? Okay. So I have a drone and I can push a lever to make it go faster. So N is what speed my lever or dial is set to, right? Speed one, speed two, like that. The feet per second is four times to N plus one. So when it's set to zero, I just turn the drone on and I haven't pushed it, it's still creeping forward slightly. And the more I push my lever, the faster it goes. Everyone okay with this, whoops, with this sentence here? <laughs> on the other hand, my kids aren't good at this. So it would fly for 300 seconds. So five minutes, 60 times five. Um, if it's really slow, but the faster they go, the sooner it crashes. I take away 20 seconds for every time they crank the dial up. So how far does it go before it crashes? How do we put together speed, time, and distance? Four and plus one times 300 times 20. N. Yeah, distance is speed times time. If you hadn't already caught the hint after doing this for almost two hours that we always multiply, <laughs> then yes. So distance. This is speed time. Time and that should make sense. If I drive at 60 miles an hour for one hour, that's 60 miles for two hours, it's 120, and so on. Okay, so the distance it goes before it crashes, so let's multiply these together 4n plus 1 times 300 minus 20n. So I need to foil. First, 4n times 300, 4 times 12, 4 times 3 is 12 with two zeros. Foil, so outside, so 4n and a minus 20n. So 4 times 20 is 80. So negative 80, oops. And 
the n times n is going to make n squared. So that was the outside. Now the inside, 1 times 300. Oh, that's an easy one. That's just plus 300. Okay, now I'm going to move my drawing picture. And then the last, so 1 times a negative 20n. Okay, that's just a negative 20n. So we get negative 80 of the n squareds. So it's traditional to put those first. How many plane ends? 1,200 minus 20 is a positive 1,180 of them, and plus 30. And you could plug in different numbers, see how far it would go. Why is it plus 30? Uh, oh, plus 100, because I am having a brain dead moment. At all, good catch. Questions about that one? If you want to challenge a home, try taking this and factoring it. Follow our process. See if you get back to the same two factors. OK, I think I've done enough of this. And my brain is falling asleep, and yours is probably also. Um, feel free to play with this more. We could always talk next class about the ones we didn't do. Uh, but I think we've done a good job. Does it make more sense when you're seeing these polynomials sort of on the page now where they might come from? How about Brenda, Victoria, Kayla? Yeah. Okay, what I want to do with our last few minutes is sort of plant the seeds in your brain for our next topic. So that way, don't worry too much about retaining this. There's no, nothing in Moodle about this topic yet. There's no homework for this topic yet. I'll try and set it up tomorrow, but I'm not expecting you to make forward progress before um, next class. What I do want to do, though, is go in our textbook. That's nice. Uh, no, not that one. It has name, right? Do, 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 do. See large enough. There we go. Okay, sure, you can save that password. Who cares? Uh... No, I won't do that another time. Okay, so I'll close the tools, chapters. So we're doing something called rational expressions next. Not go there, it's so loading. There we go, okay. Uh, ignore all of the weird curly bracket stuff at the top of the page. The thing I want to point out is on the bottom, we have fractions made up of polynomials. So for a week and a half, we've been multiplying them. Now we are dividing them because fractions are like division. Right? So that's the main thing to take out of this. When they call it rational, why do they call it a rational thing? They don't mean rational like logical that makes sense. That's because they're using the same vocabulary as the word a ratio. So 
Uh, if I say something like, uh, let's go up more. These are all ratios, seven hours per day, 60 miles per hour, $3 per gallon, 20 miles per gallon, right? You've heard of ratios, you're just comparing two things with different measurement units. So rational is built up out of the word ratio. You can see it hiding in the front. So don't think about like calm, collected Mr. Spock rational. It's just, this is a ratio, but we're using polynomials instead of other things. And these look very scary, um, but the good news is that the class is now going to be segregated into two groups of people. If you're only here for the GED and you're really sure you're not going to take any STEM classes at LCC or other places, then there's not much you need to do with these. You need to be able to plug numbers into them. That's not too hard, we'll practice it. You need to be able to be careful about dividing by zero. If you give me the fraction of three quarters, that's never zero. But if you give me two X plus three over X towards the top, if I put zero in, then I get three over zero and I'm dividing by zero. So these can kind of mathematically explode in your face if you accidentally plug zero into the denominator. So, and then the last thing is you can read a word problem and build one of these. Just like you can read a word problem and build a normal ratio, 60 miles per hour, you could read a word problem and put one of these on top of the other. And if you're only here for the GED, that's all you will need to do. Can you plug numbers in and find out what fraction you get? Can you look at the denominator and say what makes it zero? And can you create these from a word problem? If you're here because you will want to take some classes at LCC or some other place, especially STEM classes, then there's more we're going to talk about. So we're going to actually talk about how to do division, just like you could take a fraction and turn it into a division problem. And we're going to take talk about simplifying them, just like you can take a fraction and reduce it to a simpler fraction. And as just a spoiler, then let me find like the easiest one to give you as a spoiler. Yeah, that's a good one. Oh, actually, um, I, I will do it for you. I could just have you read it, but that's fine. If I wanted to simplify that, then I could just factor the top and factor the bottom. If I had a normal fraction, like nine twelfths, I could say that's three times three over three times four. The threes cancel and they get three quarters. Everyone happy with that? I like that. So now I'm doing the same thing. This is an x plus three, x minus three. And this one is a oh, bad fraction line. And x plus three, x plus two. You can foil and double check that I'm factoring correct if you wanted to. The x plus three is cancel. So what's left is an x minus three, x plus two. And I'm actually not quite done because this original one blows up in my face if x is negative 3, right? I would get a 0 times negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1. 0 times negative 1 is still 0. I'm dividing by 0. So when I write my answer to be official, I have to say not only is it x minus 3 over x plus 2, but it's also true that we're still not allowed to plug in negative 3. Because I have to like inherit that. I, I don't want to simplify it, and then I plug in x is minus 3 and the rocket crashes or whatever I'm doing. So that's like your disclaimer, don't Yeah, end. that's like my disclaimer. Careful, 
it used to be this. If you plug in negative three, then the old version of the computer program is going to run and your rocket explodes or something, right? The disclaimer is a great word. I am even going to write that. So STEM classes will do this. If you take some physics and things, you'll have to do this. But as you've seen, it's not incredibly hard. You have things you already know about factoring and things you already know about canceling and you're putting them together. And the good news is by the time you get to these physics classes, they give you this enormous graphing calculator that weighs a lot in your backpack and it does the factoring for you because they don't care if you can factor in your head anymore. So uh, even my high schooler son, my 15 year old, when he's factoring, his teacher is now letting him use the website with the nice graphing calculator website that factors. I don't know if graphing calculators have factoring. <laughs> so so ta-da, okay. So that's sort of scary, but hopefully not too scary. We're gonna be taking it really just seems like the same thing we're doing in reverse. Well, just the fraction, I guess. Yeah, we're adding fractions to polynomials. We're making fractions out of polynomials. Um, but the, the annoying thing of fractions is two things, turning them into decimals, which we're not doing. That's not part of this game, right? These aren't the same as decimal numbers. And the, Changing the mental division problems. Oh, three quarters is 0.75, if you didn't know that thing. And the division of these gets ugly. So if you are only doing the GED, there's not much ugly next class. But if you are going on later, then you're going to have to pay attention when we start dividing them. So ta-da. Now that's in your brain. It'll make more sense when we do it for real next time. OK. Any other questions? I'm going to stop the recording.